Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois. And we have got a great show for you today. We're going to be diving into the myths and legends of holiday plants. And we are going to start with the poinsettia. And you know I'm not doing this by myself. I am joined, as always, every single week by horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. Tis the season. It is. Tis here be the season where we talk like pirates. I, um, so I, I, this is like, we think of gardening and all of that stuff happening in spring and summer and trailing off in the fall. But when it comes to the industrial complex of horticulture, it's really in full swing come December time. I mean, like for one, I got a live Christmas tree this year. Um, that's a whole industry, the live trees. Um, so we're we're pretty stoked about having our first live tree. I grew up with them, but for, for as a family, little kids and all now, first time we've ever had one. Yep. We still got the artificial. So sorry, Ken. Someday, someday. <laughs> you want to put it on the deck. You, I'll I'll crush you some some of the bows off of mine, and you can smell them. Oh, yeah, potpourri. yep, yep. <laughs> Get some of that that pine potpourri. Um, we we do we have an Austrian pine uh, that we picked out this year. Um, it was very good. I, I do like the Austrian pine. I would never plant one in my yard, um, but I will put one in my house. Uh, it's got nice strong branches. Holds up those ornaments really well. Uh, the farm we went to, they also had a couple different types of fir trees and the fir trees, the true to their name, have a softer needle, but they don't hold the, the ornaments as, as strong as the Austrian pine does. Well, it's a little more pliable. Yeah. Yeah. Soft, softer branches. Yes. Yes. The, the Austrian, uh, pine, you know, they, they're pumped up. They have lots of pumpitude. And so they're very strong. Um, hear me now and believe me later. Um, so that's, that's the benefit of Austrian pine. Get, get a blue spruce. <laughs> <laughs> they look pretty. All right, wait. So Colorado blue spruce, Austrian pine, they look beautiful in the house as a Christmas tree outside. They get every disease known to humankind. So <laughs> <laughs> don't put them in your yard. <laughs> oh goodness. Well, and yes, it it is the season, and uh, today we're going to talk all about poinsettias. Now, I say poinsettia. How do you pronounce it? Uh, depends on the day. Usually poinsettia, but poinsettia. If, if mm -hmm. mood hits me, it's poinsettia. Yeah. So, I don't know what well, the proper way is, or if there is a proper way. I don't think there is a proper way. Um, we we could maybe go back in time and ask the first person that that coined that name, which we're going to dive into today. Um, and, but I, I, I will just say I've had a, a really good time diving into this particular plant. Um, and we had, had mentioned this, um, maybe in, in a previous podcast a long time ago. Um, but poinsettia, like the Christmas tree industry, I mean, it's its own market. Um, there are people who grow poinsettias in the world and that's all they do to sell them one month out of the year. Um, and so it is it it is huge from a horticultural standpoint. Um, Wasn't it the, the most widely grown or sold houseplant? Yes. And, and you yes. buy it for a couple of weeks out of the year is when you can find yep. it. Yep. It, it's the only time you can find it. Um, and it is not native to the United States, but it is native to another part of North America. And so we're going to dive into this. So Ken... Could you kick us off? What, where does poinsettia even come from? If it's kind of North American, but really south of there. Yeah, so it's native to Mexico, going down into into Central America. So I think kind of that Mexico City area, um, and, and further south. At least that's my understanding. But yeah, definitely Mexico uh, and further south. And it was you know, the Aztecs uh, used it. They used it as a dye. Uh, the red, they use the sap. Uh, I think it was to treat fevers and stuff. So they use it as medicinal. Um, and <clears throat> some, I don't remember what group it was, but the what we call poinsettia, they call 
Quit so that would be a more, I guess, indigenous name for it, uh, other than than Poinsettia or Poinsettia. So, mm-hmm. throw another reading, no, I, another name in there. I, I, uh, I need to keep going over this name in my head. That from what I read, it was the Aztec name that they gave it, but I don't know it. There's there are other indigenous peoples there that were also around. So Quet Lashoche, I am. I will get that right eventually, and it stands for the flower that withers which it's very sad, <laughs> <laughs> but it is so true of all flowers. Uh, yes. So yeah, native. And I, and I think, uh, I think in nowadays, you know, in Mexico, it's La Flor de Noche Bueno, Noche Buena, which is the Christmas Eve flower or Christmas flowers. So that's not just point set point city. There's a lot of different names out there. I think I, came across an article i don't remember where all the names were I should have written them down but even i mean there's dozens more that probably aren't as widely used nowadays but back in the day yeah so to speak were yeah i should have i should have wrote those down because even in the united states this plant had a few other names which have as soon as i heard them i immediately forgot them that when they were mentioned so it's just the, this is the nature of living in the modern day world with the internet, with information at your fingertips. You don't have to ever memorize anything. Exactly. Yes. Well, all right. So if they have all these names, uh, different names. How in the world did it get this name Poinsettia or Poinsettia? Uh, Ken, was there an uh, individual responsible for this uh, particular name? There, there was, or at least it's person it's attributed to is Joel Poinsett, who was the minister, what we would now call ambassador to Mexico. I think he was the first one from the United States to Mexico. And he is credited with kind of discovering it uh, and sending it off to the United States. I believe it was Philadelphia. They sent it off and you know, I think it was cuttings and that grew it and, you know, it, it turned into what it is today, but definitely not a, probably not the best legacy, at least in, in Mexico for, for him though. So no, but in, you know, the interesting thing with with plant names is I was taught in school that when a plant is named after a person, you always capitalize that particular plant name because it, it's kind of considered more of a proper noun when it's named after a, a, an individual. Um, the more I learned about Joel Roberts Poinsett, the less I wanted to capitalize the word poinsettia. Um, but we'll, we'll dive into that. Um, cause when, when he discovered it, I'm using air quotes for people who are listening. Um, it was already being frequently used by, um, you know, folks in Mexico, Central America, uh, a lot of the, the Spanish monks would decorate the, uh, the, their churches with this plant during Christmas time, because the flowering did coincide with Christmas holiday. Um, so it was used you know, readily. And it was a beautiful woody plant that, that bloomed in December. Um, and then he discovered it, uh, and, and took some cuttings and sent it off to some botanists in the United States. Um, and then I, I believe it was the Philadelphia flower show. I think it was a Philadelphia flower show. If it's been running for that long, cause it still goes on today. Um, yeah, there's some, some flower show in Philadelphia, something. It, I don't know if it's the same, concurrently running a flower show, but it was something in Philadelphia in about 1829. It made its debut in the United States. Yes. And I believe shortly after that, he was asked to leave Mexico <laughs> <laughs> because he was causing lots of problems. And so what, what was it? He, what I have down in my notes here and is basically he believed in American expansion at any cost and like, and so he was just spreading this or building up maybe this dissent in Mexico or the Mexican government trying to prop up the U.S. government. Um, I think it was yeah, Freemasonry and mm-hmm. yeah, get the, I guess, yeah, increase that support of America uh, in Mexico. Yes. And, yeah. I mean, he was kind of, you mentioned Freemason. I mean, that was. That that kind of like uh, is back when Freemasons were more like the Freemasons we saw in the movie National Treasure or something, you know, <laughs> where they're 
they're doing all kinds of secretive acts uh, in their secretive buildings. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, he's really trying to prop up the U.S. government. And what didn't the um, Mexican people have a name that that describes um, uh, the the word that we used before we started recording? I don't think we can say um, <laughs> the behavior of Poinsett the, uh, uh, when he <laughs> was like point points pointissimo point, or point. I have to look that up now. Poinsettissimo. I'm not going to pronounce these things correctly. I'm so sorry. I study German. Um, Me too. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a big mistake. <laughs> so what I, I found here is poinsettismo. I, again, that might be a mispronunciation uh, of the word. Um, and there's a couple things that this translates to. Um, intrusive. Um, officious conduct, arrogant, high-handedness, um, you're a jerk. Um, this, but it is this name, pointis, 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 boy, I can't say it, pointismo, uh, poinsettismo is, yeah. is named after the same guy that the poinsettia is named after. So obviously the Mexican people did not like this guy. <laughs> they made a whole word, uh, uh, uh that, describes something brought bad like negative human uh you know, conduct yeah i think in later several years later it became secretary of war mm -hmm. and was played a part in the displacement of the cherokee people trail of tears mm -hmm. and all that stuff so not not the best history uh, on him no as, as we look back yeah that he basically kicked off the trail of tears uh uh in like you know, when it was all sanctioned by the U.S. government to move like a hundred thousand people from the east out to the west, um, so uh, yeah, that's probably why I don't want to be like I'm not as like ah, I want to capitalize this to honor Joel Poinsett, um, which I think is interesting information that uh, you know we had a Poinsettia page uh, with extension and it didn't mention any of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I've and reading stuff you came across of maybe a little bit more of a push to go back to the or not go back to but go to the quite the Choche, the more I guess mm -hmm. indigenous name if you want to call it that opposed to Winsetta Winsetia mm -hmm. quite the Choche. I mean I'll get it eventually so I'm I'm fine with whatever but um it it, it, it is kind of hard and some people might who who do maybe read up on this or know more uh, than I do, uh, will say, well, Joel Poinsett also was a founding member of the Smithsonian and, you know, I'm sure did other good things. Um, but, you know, also a slave owner also did a lot of other bad things. So boy, yeah. history's harsh. <laughs> it's all shades of gray. <laughs> it really, really has become that, um, for this beautiful holiday plant. <laughs> Well, Ken, so talked about the history, how Poinsettia got one of its names, its most popular name, at least here in the United States. Um, let's talk about the plant itself now. Um, I guess, what did it look like growing in its its native range and, and habitat down in Mexico, Central and South America? Yeah, so it's a, it's a perennial. I mean, it's a woody plant and it gets much bigger than what we are accustomed to. I mean, it's going to get Feet, several feet tall um and the pictures i've seen i've never seen it in the wild but it's a little more it's kind of scraggly looking it's it's longer elongated it's not the nice compact plant uh, that we that we're used to so there's been a lot of of breeding and other things that have gone into getting it to the point where um kind of where we're at now a lot of that started at i think like in the 40s um, when a lot of that breeding is and using it as a house plant really kind of came into into play here in the united states anyway Mm -hmm. Right, like back in the 30s and 40s, the the Brax leaves. I guess we, we haven't even gotten to that flower morphology yet. What's a flower and what's not a flower on the plant? But um, the red part, which is actually not technically the flower, um, it is a more of a leaf. Um, 
that would only last, uh, I read up to 10 days after that, they would fall off. Um, so it was very short lived, very, very short lived in terms of its kind of display colors. Um, and it was that breeding that really occurred throughout the 20th century that gave us that poinsettia that we know today where I can have, I have one on my dining room table. It has been red since we bought it in, like before Thanksgiving and it looks the same. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's probably going to hold on to those bracts till after Christmas. So, I mean, it's, they've made a lot of improvements on just how long it holds on to those. And I think when it, because it, those bracts didn't last very long, I think originally it was used more as a cut flower. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know, the breeding, we got into more compact and longer lasting, and then we could use it as a help a house plant if we do now. Yeah. Well, and I I also have taken poinsettias and I've overwintered them and I've planted them in my landscape before, and they do turn into a a nice sized shrub. Um, obviously, they're not winter hardy here in Illinois, but throughout the summer, it's this beautiful green. Um, pretty full looking shrub. It gets pretty big, puts on a lot of growth um, between when I can get it out in the spring and it dies back in the fall. Yeah. Can't grow them outside year round yet. Not yet. Working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully never will be able to, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> when we're old and retired, we'll see. Yes. <laughs> so circling back a little bit, we we didn't really dive much into to another kind of controversial issue that involves pretty much the market of the, the poinsettia plant. And that is the fact that it is native uh, to Mexico, Central America, yet that part of the world makes almost nothing on the production or sale of that plant throughout the entire world. And the, I mean, this is a, as I mentioned before, this is a huge industry um, you know, Ken mentioned number one selling house plant. Um, so it's, it's, there's a lot of money to be made here. And this is kind of an interesting train of events. There's, um, we'll, we'll have to do a little bit of sleuthing, I guess, on this one. So looking at, um, an article in Chronica Horticulture, which is a, a publication, uh, they have an article in their poinsettia, history and transformation, uh, they said that Mexican growers were convinced that Joel Poinsett had patented poinsettias in the U.S., and this was to keep Mexican growers from selling them in the U.S., essentially an embargo on um, Mexican production of the, the poinsettia plant. And um, they even had, they found newspaper articles and everything like this in from Mexico that, that spelled this out. However, when they went and looked at like the U.S. where the patent office, and they've been doing patents since uh, 1795, 1795 um, they could not find any patent or document on poinsettia. So somebody started a rumor down in Mexico that they couldn't do this. Your, you can raise suspicions upon whomever. Um, <laughs> maybe it was Joel Poinsett. Um, maybe it was uh, a nursery grower that wanted to corner the market. Uh, either way, um, I, I would say at this point in time, the market has been cornered. I don't know how you would break into that at this point in time because the genetics are so stringently controlled uh, on these plants with all the breeding, as we had mentioned, that has occurred here. It, it would be It'd be tough to go back to square one with the wild poinsettia and start back over. Yeah, I think more of the production is in Mexico and Central America now, but it's U.S. or European mm -hmm. uh, businesses doing it. It's not businesses from there. Because like, I think yeah. you know, with with a lot of the heating costs, the few, the heating costs and stuff that go, are associated with this, trying to produce this in the winter, it's it's cheaper to do it down there and then import the plants uh, into the U.S. Or, or Europe. And we even have, I and, and we were researching for this uh, topic, we discovered 
we have a major poinsettia trial here in Illinois <laughs> um, that we didn't even know about. It's a commercial grower uh, in Illinois that um, does an open house every year. So um, yeah, Ken and I were just surprised like, oh, that's that's a lot of poinsettias under glass. Um, and speaking of poinsettias under glass, Ken, how do they grow these plants? Because they have some pretty specific daylight requirements, right? There's what what does it take to get a poinsettia to flower? Yeah, so poinsettias are referred to as short day plants, um, but it's actually long night. So th basically, the the length of the night is going to influence when they start blooming. So once they hit a certain a certain amount of da darkness at night, they will they will induce flowering in these plants. So those will start producing those red bracts, start producing those yeah those flowers, those little yellow dots in the middle of the bracts. Those are actually the flowers. Is that, uh, are that term is involucre is that the botanical term for the flowers i don't know that's cyathia. What, cyathia that's what it is yeah never what's the never, in, what's the involucre <laughs> hmm. i'm i'm making things up as i go so <laughs> yeah can here real quick i'm going to cut in if you're curious as to what an involucre is it is a whirl of bracts that are close or close and underneath a flower or inflorescence. So think of like a dandelion, all those little green uh, leaf-like things underneath the flower, those would be an involucre. Also the cap of an acorn is also considered an involucre. So if you're curious, now you know. And now we'll return to our discussion on poinsettias. So, sorry, Ken, I just <laughs> broke your, your, your train of thought. <laughs> sorry. I'm trying to think of how many hours it requires. Um, is it 12 and 12? 11.75 hours. That's so specific. Darkness. So once you hit that point, that'll start the formation. But if you interrupt that at all, that'll break it. So you know, when they're growing these, they're, they're putting on black cloth at night uh, to prevent that. Same thing if you were doing this at home. That's why you'd want to put them in a dark room or in a closet under a box, something like that. So you don't have any light interrupting that darkness because um, otherwise that'll that'll mess up that flower production. So that's that's one of those kind of a little bit of added difficulty uh, in there because you do have to have that darkness. And But because of that, you can play with and force them to bloom when you want them to. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're growing them in an area where maybe they're going to bloom earlier and they would have started blooming earlier and they wouldn't, you're going to miss that Christmas market, you can interrupt that night period to to delay that until they, they would normally be blooming or vice versa. If you're in an area where they would, start blooming you know after that peak market you can then force them to bloom right later by creating that darkness that they wouldn't normally have um if you don't do something about it so they, they can't be manipulated it's not like like christmas cactus that you get this time of year that's um also day length a lot of plants uh, the flowering is, is driven by day length and that can be manipulated to to meet that market that you want mm -hmm. yeah a lot of people think it's temperature but more often than not, plants are controlled by the length of day or or night, you know, this is the case. So, um, and so that it's the light exposure, essentially. And when you have control of that, as the major poinsettia growers have, when they have control, they can do all kinds of like little minor adjustments and tinkering. And they so stringently try to uh, manage that light exposure. Um, I've been told that people are not even allowed to like walk in to a, a garden house or a, a greenhouse where the shade where the the cloth is over it. They're trying to exclude light because simply just walking in, opening the door, that can disrupt that light for any plants that get exposed to the light coming into the doorway. Yeah, I'm not sure how much intensity you can have, but mm -hmm. I think it's a whole like you're not having a street light by your plants and getting that the darkness you need. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Ken, I, I guess there is a lot of difficulty and there's a lot of work that goes into producing a poinsettia in Illinois because, um, well, one, you got to control the light because we have this whole planet that's on this axis thing that doesn't like to give us 12 hour days, 12 hour nights. Um, so so that's one aspect, but it's a tropical plant. And the one thing that I find that happens a lot is that when this plant goes from greenhouse to the store and then 
gets bought at the store by the consumer and taken home, a lot of times it's cold outside. After all, it's December in Illinois, um, and these plants get home, and and after about a day or two, they see these this browning at the tips or the margins where uh, it got exposed to that cold. So how what's a good technique for transporting these plants from store to home? So double bagging would be good. Ideally, you'd have paper or something. Either the store would have it or you bring a newspaper with you. Wrap your plants, put it in the bag. Make sure you close the top of that bag off. If you just leave that bag open, cold air can get in. Um, I guess going back even a step further, if it's a really cold day, don't buy the plants if you can avoid it. Wait till it's a little bit warmer out. You know, <laughs> don't go out buying them when there's a polar vortex coming through or something like that. Um, so, so plan that out if, if at all possible. Again, easier said than done a lot of times, but hmm. try to go on a little bit warmer day or or during the day when it's warmer compared to at night. Um, bet double bag them, insulate them, make sure that top's closed. Um, park close to the entrance or have go with somebody so they can start the car. You don't want to, you know, if you're shopping for a while, your car gets cold, you bring them in, it's going to take a little time to warm it up. So if you have your vehicle warmed already, you just reduce the time. It's going to be exposed to those cold temperatures. Don't put them in the trunk of the car because um, that's <laughs> not going to be as warm as, as the cabin. So I'll uh, forget about them, it. Keep them warm with you. Don't put them up against the window because that window is going to be cold and that's going to, I mean, the temperature is, and the forties and stuff can damage uh, these. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's going to need to be, you know, avoid those cold temperatures, if at all possible, you know, avoid plants. You know, a lot of times you go into the, the big box stores, big doors, they're opening and closing lined with point studies and all that cold air is getting sucked in every time somebody comes in. So that's the only display they have do it further from the door. So those aren't going to be as exposed to the cold. Alternatively, I've seen where they've got them set up you know, kind of in their outdoor center that's not terribly well insulated. So they've got a big heater running. Mm-hmm. The ones right underneath the heater are always getting burned up because <laughs> it's either too hot or it's drying them out so fast they keep they don't keep up with the watering. So mm-hmm. do it. Take a little time and look through the plants. Don't just grab one and, and hope for the best. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I I feel like um once I purchase my my poinsettia, I'm I'm committed to taking care of that plant as well. Um, and as I mentioned, I, I plant these things once, if, if they survive in my house over winter, I will plant them out in my garden. I, I will say if folks are interested, um, in more information, maybe something to sit down and read, we can link to Ken's actually wrote an info sheet about this, uh, about poinsettias and, and care. Um, so we'll put that link down, down below in the thing, Bob. Um, and, but I would say the biggest thing when you get that thing home, it usually has a decorative foil around the pot. And usually the pot's just, maybe it's a clay, plastic color. It's it's plastic, but it's colored like it's ceramic clay or something, or it's just a black pot, plastic pot. Um, that decorative foil wrapper uh, just keeps too much moisture, too much water inside that pot. We really need the, the water to be able to drain out of the pot into a saucer or into the sink. Uh, it needs to be able to leave because the poinsettias don't like having water up against the roots. They like, they, they need to have good drainage. And so if I could give you one tip, if you want this to survive a little bit longer and maybe even plant it in your landscape for the springtime, take that foil wrapper off. Uh, Ken got any more care tips to get it through the winter to spring? Yeah. Or if you want the foil, take it out to water and let it drain, Mm -hmm. thoroughly drain before you put it back in so it's not holding all that yep. water or you can poke holes in the foil and put, yeah, it in the put a little plate under it yep yeah, or give the kids some markers and they can draw on the pot oh that's a great idea <laughs> see ken is full of great and, ideas and themselves and the table and the walls and anything else who so, so. <laughs> drew with permanent <laughs> marker on the dining room table rubbing out that happened as your friend uh, is does it <laughs> oh well i'm gonna have to try it it's been on there or, for a few months or nail polish remover one of the two can't remember what we use now Try those. Do rubbing alcohol first. Fire. <laughs> <laughs> that works. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be I just make sure they're well watered. And you know, once they start to lose those those bracts, then just kind of treat them like a house plant um, from then on out. So not not terribly. Most people toss them. They're mm-hmm. obviously probably 95%, if not more, just toss them, which mm-hmm. is fine. That's what you want to do. Compost them. And 
the growers appreciate you buying new ones every year. Mm -hmm. So this comes back to the idea of poinsettia, you know, when it's in my yard, grows in this big shrub, but it's flowering when it's like six inches tall. So how do they get that to happen? <laughs> how does a, a, a commercial greenhouse force a short little poinsettia where they really want to get tall. Do, do you know how they do that, Ken? So all, all, everything you're buying is going to be done by a cutting. So they're not growing this from seed. So these are all cuttings that have been started. Um, they found that, you know, if you've got, so usually they're fairly straight, not a whole lot of branching. Uh, they found, I don't remember when, that if you, if you were to graft a, a non-branching or Plant that grow branches very little that cultivar onto a brand more branching type. They found there's actually a phytoplasma uh, that causes a lot of that branching or the plants to become to branch more than they would normally would. Um, so that once that was discovered, that kind of you know did a lot of stuff for for these becoming house plants because you can get that more branching. More branching means more bracts, more leaves, all of that. Um, more full, yeah. People yeah. like full plants, not the tall, scraggly Charlie Brown Christmas mm -hmm. tree types. Um, and then on top of that, you've got your plant growth regulators that can be applied to plants. That's going to reduce the growth, make them more compact, uh, pinching plants. So just like you would with mums or something like that, you can go off, pinch off those growing points. That'll cause them to branch, create more branching. So there's, you've got the, your phytoplasma, um, that that's introduced to the plants. It doesn't harm them at all. It just creates, causes them to branch more. You got your plant growth regulators that'll cause branching and, and reduce growth, more compact growth. And then pinching, which would do the same thing. So you've got all those things going on. Create that nice, tight, compact plant. It's got a lot of leaves, a lot of bracts for you. And you can do that at home. If you're growing outside, go out and pinch them. Uh, to create more branching, you get a more compact plant. So much has gone into the development of these poinsettias that everybody buys this time of year. Um, interesting, the, that phytoplasma that, that they discover that moved from poinsettias that had a kind of a tighter branching, they could graft them on there and, and move that disease into that other one to promote more branching into other plants. That's very interesting. Yeah. I don't know. I don't want to see a disease in air quotes too. I mean, it is an alteration, yeah. but I think usually it hurt it. associate disease with something bad, but in this yeah. type of case, it's, it's still probably a disease, but a desirable one. Mm -hmm. It's nice for us. I don't know how the poinsettia feels about it, <laughs> if it does at all. Um, interesting. So yeah, yeah, the phytoplasma, which is not we look we we looked this up because there was a, an article where they kept calling it a virus. We're like, wait a second, that's over here. It's phytoplasma. Over it's here, it's this virus. These are two different things. So it, it is not the virus. If you're reading one uh, source, um, it is a phytoplasma that is causing that improved branching uh, on poinsettia. Yeah, they found, you know, when they put that non-branching on there, when they take cuttings of that non-branching, they're more branched. So that's kind of how they mm -hmm. figured out something was was going on there and eventually isolated it. Yeah, because because genetics can't move. Like they can't move genes from one to the other. Uh, so they knew that it had to be some type of a pathogen that was going from one plant into the grafted, between the graft into the new uh, part. Yeah. Fascinating. Science. So sciencey, which of course brings us around to maybe the most famous legend of uh, poinsettia as deadly poisonous, right, Ken? Uh, I mean, looking at it is dangerous. Um, <laughs> and was, did this start? I think there was a story about uh, a, a child that had eaten poinsettia and either got sick or, or possibly died from this um but actually i don't think that really became what the the actual story was um so how poisonous is this plant can i put it on my salad <laughs> so, well you could but probably not gonna can i survive salad. it <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, so i think it was it was around somewhere around 1919 was where this point said uh or point said he is is deadly uh or two-year-old kid ate some and then died uh, afterwards um but they've studies have been done and it's 
it's not toxic. I should say not toxic, but it's not deadly poisonous. You'd have to eat pounds of it um, in order for it to to cause harm. Um, so they, there was an experiment with rats um, they, where they fed them poinsettias and they tried to see what the dose would be. Uh, and after eating an equivalent of 500 leaves or 2.2 pounds of sap, they did not find they didn't kill the rats. They That's a lot of poinsettia. The equivalent to a human. So Ooh. I suppose if you really wanted to, you could have a poinsettia salad. I can't imagine it tastes very good. I, I, would I not bet it doesn't it. taste good. It has a white sap, so I, I imagine it really doesn't taste good. <laughs> yeah, so the, the sap can cause dermatitis in some people. So that may be a little bit where it comes from. So some people may be sensitive to that sap, um, but not deadly poisonous. Mm-hmm. Well, you think about what they were spraying on those plants back in the 1920s. I mean, arsenic and lead, um, high doses of cadmium. I mean, (laughs) just everything. (laughs) Not good. Yeah. So So it was was dangerous to eat anything. Yeah. Still still want to avoid it. Keep it away from kids and and animals. Yeah. uh, Because it probably would probably could cause an upset stomach, but should not have to worry about anybody dying. If you're eating it. But if you're concerned, talk to a doctor. Go to the ER. If you're concerned, yep. better be safe than sorry. Yep. Go to the ER, talk to a doctor, call poison control, do all of those things because we are not human doctors. I'm not even a, a doctor doctor. So <laughs> oh goodness. So I I already have a point set idea, but I would like to go shopping for more poinsettias. I am very familiar with the bright red colored poinsettia. But when I was looking at some of these different um, cultivars that are at these various trials throughout, well, the one in Illinois and they have others throughout the the U.S., I see colors I don't associate with poinsettia. Um, Of course, there's white, um, red and white, and there's shades of almost every color imaginable between those two. Um, I all, I all even saw an orange shaded or colored poinsettia. Um, do I need to go get my eyes checked? Is my prescription off, Ken? <laughs> Why are there orange colored poinsettias? They're the magic of breeding. So if you've got mm-hmm. reds, you get your bright red, there's darker reds. on some of the maroons I've seen pictures of. I've never seen them in person. Um, the whites, any red and whites is what you're typically going to find in the store, mm-hmm. at least where I'm at in Illinois. Maybe if you're in a bigger Chicago or something, you be able to find some of these weird colors. But yeah, orange, uh, I've seen yellows, stuff that's getting into purple uh, almost. There's ones that have speckled, at least so red with white speckles or stripes and all kinds of other stuff. You do occasionally see blue ones. So those are not actually the plant. Those have been painted uh, in some way. But you've got red, yellow, white, orange, purplish, pinks, lots of pinks and stuff too. So it's not, yeah, it's just not your your grandparents. White said it's oh. all kinds of different colors. They're 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 even messing with the the leaves and the bracts too. You have ruffled, um, or where the, the fringe or the margin of the leaf is is wavy, um, and just just all these creative things. And as Ken said, I'm probably not going to find that in my area of Illinois, um, but maybe some other listeners, if you're in, uh, have maybe a more specialty type grower in your neck of the woods, you might find some of these really neat, interesting and unique poinsettias. Um, so yeah, buy them up, let them know that you like them and you want to, you want them to make more of them. Yeah, or the internet. Mm-hmm. You can find anything it does exist. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't know. Internet. Plants, yeah, scares me sometimes. Shipping may get complicated too, but <laughs> it definitely will. <laughs> I'll have to, I'll have to have it shipped here in the summer, and then do everything the growers do. <laughs> it's not going to happen. I can barely <laughs> keep a normal plant alive, like a mother-in-law's tongue. No, if I do kill my mother-in-law's tongue, I'm in trouble. So, Just buy a whole bunch of them, spend a lot of money, and then you feel obligated to take care of it yes there you go that's what i did with my ginger so well that was a lot of great information about poinsettias uh you probably didn't know you needed to know i guess you didn't need to know it but now you do um 
And then if you want to forget about it, go ahead and re-listen to us again. Um, it's that easy. So uh, the Good Growing Podcast is a production of University of Illinois Extension, edited this week by Ken. Are you editing this week? Ah, oh, he gave me the nod. All right. Well, thank you, Ken. And thank you for being here with me today to talk about the good old poinsettia, or how do we pronounce the the original um, name? <laughs> I'm like pronunciation here. Wet la chauche. Wet la chauche. Working on it. I'll get it. <laughs> yes, Wet thank you. And, and this isn't necessarily useless. Remember, we got all kinds of trivia, holiday trivia coming up. Just make comes right. Handy. Remember who you learned it from. Oh, yes. That's right. Name your trivia team after us. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Tell everybody, tell everybody to subscribe. Subscribe. We get no extra money for any loyalty <laughs> or any more people you bring. We're a university, so, uh, but we do want people to know about us. Just, just the ego boost. That's right. We like it. <laughs> <laughs> Makes us feel good. <laughs> and uh, let's do this again next week. Oh, we shall do this again next week. We might continue this conversation about holiday plants and do another deep dive. Um, and I know we're going to be talking about holiday spices coming up, so that's going to be another fun episode as well. So, listeners. Thank you for doing what you do best, and that is listening, or if you're watching this on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing. We can circle back, right? We can do that. Sure. Serpentine. Yes, it's a serpentine uh, train of thought here. Um, <laughs> Stream of conscious podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> My stream of conscious, not good, not good. Don't want to go in there.